So we're going to start in, in the, the first verse through verse 10, really talking about um, what the, the tabernacle looked like. We talked about that somewhat last week, but we're going to dive into that some, with some more detail and look at the comparison between what they used to do and what Christ has done and how that looks for us believers in Christ. Now, the first covenant was all, uh, also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. We, we know that. This is somewhat what it looked like. And he says the old covenant, he's talking about the first covenant, right? He says that there. That's with, with that one that, w- that was built in the wilderness and the wild. And it was significant. And, and it, it, it gives you great detail of what, it would, what the dimensions were on it. But it had purpose for ministry. Right? It had purpose for sacrifice, sacrifice of sin, and it had purpose for provision. Now we look at the layout of, of the tabernacle. This is, again, Exodus 35 through 40. You look at the, uh, the altar, uh, uh, burning off altar or the brazen altar, all right? and then the bronze laver, uh, laver which was a, a wash station. And those two are outside of the tabernacle itself. They're in the courtyard if you will. And all that's going to be put into to, uh, explanation here in a minute. But uh, as, we, as we open it up, there was a reason for this in ministry. You walk into the east there, the opening gate, the entrance gate's always on the east. There was a design for that. And you walk in, and you immediately walk into your sin. Your sacrifices happen right there at the very beginning. If you're going to get into anywhere closer to God, if you're going to get into the presence of God, you first have to deal with sin. It was that way in the Old Testament, and it's no different now in the New Testament. What separates us from God is is not anything more than sin. Your sin separates you from God. That's why he says, I come to give you life, and that life more abundantly. Right? And we saw the wages of sin is death, if God, if Christ came to give you life, right, but you don't accept that life, then you, the alternate has to be death. So what you have to do, if you're an uh, old Jew in those days, is you would go right to the east gates with your offerings, and you would lay it on the altar. This is the altar of sacrifice, or the brazen altar. It was about seven fu- uh, cubic feet. Okay, and it was... It was um, pretty massive and that's where they would sacrifice it says for the life of the flesh and, and it is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls this is Levitical law for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul right and then this is in John 1 this is John uh, uh, John the baptizer speaking out. He says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming uh, unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John was the forerunner, and he spoke even then about the sacrifice that Jesus would make. He didn't make his sacrifice on an altar. He took it on, made it on a cross. But the blood was still shed. So that's the first thing you would run into. The second thing you would run into would be after you have, you have taken the blood of one animal that was killed and put it on the blood of the, of the other animal, they would then take that animal as far as they possibly could away because the thing is they didn't want to see that animal back in town. That's the representation of your sins, right? So you don't want to see your sins again you don't want to see those animals again. Some people say they took them to the cliffs and threw them off the cliffs and made sure that they were definitely gone. Right? Official. There it is. That was for the reason for the substitutionary atonement. All right. So once that's happened, and and you know the priest is covered in blood for you. For your sins. He goes and then washes himself with this, 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 this cleansing. He says the priest uh, must wash in, 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 before ministering at the altar or entering 
the tabernacle. So you can't, number one, you have to deal with your sins. Number two, you have to be cleansed from your sins after you've, you've made that substitutionary sacrifice. Right? You can't have it on your hands. You can't have it on your feet. You have to be cleansed and clean before you can go any further. We are washed by the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Back into Hebrews, verse 2 here. For a tabernacle was set up in the first room, which was called the holy place, and where, uh, where the lampstand, the table, uh, of, and, of, and the, the presentation, or pres- presentation loaves. So this is what we're talking about here. And once you got past the brazen altar, once you got past the, 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 the washing or the laver, you would now enter into the holy place. Not the holy of holies, the holy place. The holy place was roughly twice the size of the holy of holies. Okay, it was maybe 15 by 30 by 15 foot high. And on it, it had the table of, of showbread, which was 12 loaves of bread for each tribe. The only ones that could eat that were the priests. And then they had the lampstand uh, there. And then we talked about last week, they had the altar of incense where the, the aroma and the smoke would go up. Uh, and the incense, the fragrance would go up. All of this is in the holy place where the, the priests could enter in and stay. Right? The lampstand, this is the comparison. Now, again, we wanted to do this. Jesus' sacrifice takes our, 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 our substitutionary atonement. He is our sacrifice, right? And then he is the one that's clean enough because he doesn't have to forgive him of his own sins because he sinned not, right? So he is now able to enter into this place. And then when we get into the holy place, we have the lampstand. And there's seven uh, uh, candelabras there, and they're going and, and so this is, again, a representation. I am the light of the world, right? Jesus is the light. And not only that, he is the provision, right? He says this, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and who believes in me will never thirst. See that? There was never a system set up before Jesus that would satisfy, that would satisfy the priest would always have to be, be doing these things day after day. And then they could only go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur that one day. But every day they made sacrifices. Every day they, they, they went into the holy place. Now back into that. Behind the second curtain, the tabernacle was called the most holy place. We know it as the Holy of Holies. And that is, again, a 15 by 15 room about 15 high with a curtain there and only the high priest could go in there one day a year. We've talked about that uh, and quite extensively, uh, but it's significant because that's where the presence of God is. And here's what's in it. It contains a gold altar and incense of the Ark of the Covenant covered with gold on all sides in which there was a gold, uh, a gold jar containing manna, right? Aaron's staff that budded and the tablet of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Let's talk about the first one, the manna from heaven. All right, that's when God pulled them out of Egypt and provided for them in the wilderness. Right? Aaron, who is the high priest of the, of the Jews, with his, his staff was there. What he ruled and guided with was there. And then the, all, the law itself was there. In the Ark of the Covenant, all there. So we talked about this kind of, this is what it looked like. And that was the mercy seat on top there where the presence of God resided on earth. But inside that box is, are those things that he was just talking about in, in verse 4. Again, we talked about he is the new high priest, right? Where Aaron's was, he is now, right? Where, where the law is, right? Jesus is now the law the, where he has given us the only access to God. Because if you are a lawbreaker, there's no way to get to God. God, Jesus is our only way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through the Son, right? And so we see this kind of these things. God is the chosen high priest, or Jesus is the chosen high priest. Aaron and staff, the man of Jesus is the bread of life. Again, in the Ten Commandments, Jesus is the per- perfect sinless human who obeyed all God's laws. 
that's important. That's all the things that are in the Ten Command or in the Ark of the Covenant. So let's go back into the, into the, the law itself. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, "Don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets, because they were all had their." Uh, their, their feathers ruffled by Jesus and the presence of Jesus because he's doing things that is not heard of. He's healing people on the Sabbath. He's touching lepers. He's, he's healing uh, the sick. He's healing the blind. Uh, you know, he's turning happy meals into full-blown uh, 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 huge meals for thousands of people. He's walking on waters. He's calming storms. He's doing all kinds of things that are blowing people's minds. And, and he wants to clarify for these people, these, these scribes and Pharisees that are so protective of the law. He says, don't assume that I came to destroy the law of the prophets, not the stuff that you have put in there, not the added to amendments that the Pharisees have done, right? No, don't, don't think I did that. I didn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Why? Because he's the only one who can, right? Over 600 and something laws, he's the only one who can. So he says, don't think that, in fact, he goes on to even more detail. For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all, until all things are accomplished. He will fulfill the law. He's the only one who can. It's important that we see that. Back into Hebrews. The cherubim of glory. Again, the mercy seat that was up top. Uh, where, where, where above it, it, it overshadowing the mercy seat. Uh, it is impossible to speak about these things in detail right now. He doesn't want to waste time with that right now. They would know that. These are Jews. They would know that their whole life for what this is. He doesn't go into a lot of detail, so I'm not either because I don't. I, he will get to some things later in the book, but we just want to keep on going with where, where this main theme is for the morning. With these things set up this way, the priests entered the first room repeatedly performing their ministries. The holy place where the bread was, where the lampstands were, where the incense, uh, altar of incense were, that happened repeatedly, daily. They would go in there and they would pray and they would, and they would, uh, uh, they would do ministry. They would teach and do all kinds of other things. But the high priest alone entered the second room. And he does this the only once a year, Yom Kippur, and never uh, without blood, right? He had, he had blood and he would... Psh- sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, which offered for uh, sin for himself and for the people. Right? Why? Because he's, he's a sinful man, just like me and you and everybody else. All have sinned and come short. Right? He is no different. And, he, and this is important. Once a day he did that, or once a year he did that, at Yom Kippur. And he did it for not only for himself, but for the people. The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way in, uh, into the holy place, or the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. Right? This was never the permanent plan. Again, the writer is continuing to beat that point home. And he wants to make it clear. He does not, he does not badmouth the Judaistic custom. He doesn't say that it was a bad system. It was the best they had. But he is making the point is it was always a temporary thing. Right? It was always a temporary thing. I, 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 I hear it this way. Um, I, I bought my truck brand new. Right? Like eight years ago. Bought it brand new. So happy. Right? And then... Three months later, the new year came out, and that was a lot better to me. I thought that was a lot better, right? Some of you guys can, can, can understand, like, yeah, we know things when they're new, they're new, right? But everything has, and especially in this world, like you can go buy a, a, a cell phone, and then a week later, it's obsolete, right? Uh, you know, we live in that kind of society with technologies always moving and, and going, uh, computers and technology is just advancing. But this, this is also just a comparison of it's a good thing. It's a good thing what the, the Jews had with the high priest 
and the substitutionary atonement for their sins. But number one, it was a temporary thing. And number two, it was never going to be enough to get rid of sin totally. It was never going to be enough. So the Holy Spirit is, is, is consistently trying to make this point. This is the symbol of the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered uh, that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. Uh, put, put it into layman terms, that old system would never put you in the presence of God immediately and eternally, which we've been talking about in, in, in the past weeks. Right? It's, when he says perfect, it, when we, it's one way to take it, but the way you can get to perfection is also in the presence of God. Right? If, there, if, you're with, if you're not perfect, then there are shortcomings. All have come short of the glory of God, right? But Christ makes us perfect. See? You see there? And not only does he make, so, make us perfect, but the worshiper's conscience. We can enter into the throne room of God with absolute uh, with purity and perfection, not because of what we've done, but what Christ has done for us. You see? You see the difference? And we can understand that. We can have that, that firming faith, that confidence to know that we don't have to do our best effort. We just have to love Jesus Christ with all our heart, soul, and mind. Right? We have to understand that He's our Savior and not, our, not of our own. We have to say, understand that He's the high priest that puts us in the presence of God. There's nothing that we can do. They are physical regulations, right? And only deal with food, drink, and various washing uh, imposed until the time of restoration. Again, talking about the temporal things of that old custom, right? They had food there. That's good. When you get hungry, you eat, right? What's going to happen again is that food will burn off and you will become hungry again. Right? The same way in that. Those customs, you, you would do these things and then they would come to the surface again. Right? Same way with drink. When you drink, you are drink till you're satisfied and then your body wears it out and then you get thirsty again. And then do you remember that, what I said in Matthew, or, uh, in Matthew where it says, Jesus says, right, come after me and take my bread and you'll never hunger again and you'll never thirst again. Right? That's the importance. And these washings, you can be clean for a day, but then you're going to sin again. There's never any, uh, uh, an eternal uh, restoration in the old system. But the Messiah has appeared. And this is where you really got to understand the weight of Judaism and this life-altering decision that they are facing. But the Messiah, the one that they, they all knew was coming, the Messiah has appeared, the high priest of the good thing uh, that, have, that, have, that have come, right? In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He's talking about heavenly. We have a heavenly high priest. We have a heavenly tabernacle, right? Our loved ones are there now. Our ones that have gone on before us are there now with our great high priest of the good things that have come, right? They're, they're done. And it's not the tabernacle in the wilderness. It's not even the tabernacle that Herod made. It's a bigger one, and it's better, right? His kingdom is not of this earth. And continue, he enters the most holy place once for all. Again, redundant, but listen to the, the magnitude of it. He enters into the presence of God forever. Not just once a year forever right and when they would sprinkle blood on the uh the mercy seat not by the blood of goats and calves which they did but by his own blood his spotless perfect unblemished blood having obtained eternal redemption I love that he's the only one that can and he did and that's the decision they're having to make do I really believe this? Do I really believe this enough to not go to synagogue Saturday? 
enough to maybe have my family disown me, enough to, to um, leave what everything I've known for years and years and years, heritage. And guys, we know in, 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 in Gothway, Texas, we, we love our, our life. We love our way of life, right? And, and, and you sometimes, some of you guys here are generation, generation, generation Gothwaite folks, right? I'm a little move in. Some of you guys have deep-rooted families here. And think, think of it just one day, you make a decision where everything is, is considered not okay. You're, you, what do you mean you're, you're not doing this anymore? What do you, I mean, think of it this way, in, in just our concept of, of, of where we're at. What if somebody goes down the road and starts another church or, or some kind of assembly like that, and they say, this is how cults actually happen. They say, this is what you should believe, and a bunch of your family go and believe it. <clears throat> how would you feel? How would you react? Like you know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life and you know Christianity and you know what is truth and not truth, but all of a sudden they have been totally brainwashed and totally taught to believe a different way. How are you as a family going to feel about that? Right? This is maybe a comparison of what they might have been dealing with. And here's the deal. They were right. They're leaving their old custom to go to this new custom, and this new custom is truth. It's a big decision. Heavy. The book of Hebrews is super heavy for a Jew. Super heavy. And then we'll finish up these last two verses. For the blood of, of goats and bulls and the ashes of young cows sprinkled the, uh, uh, those who were defiled, the sinners right? That's what they did in the old. Sanctified for the purification of the flesh. It, it only went to the surface. It didn't touch the heart, right? Remember Jesus, right, when he was talking about to the scribes and the Pharisees, right? He said, you know, you worry about the outside of the cup. The outside of the cup's dirty, right? But the inside is just as dirty or filthy, right? Worry about the inside of the cup. That's the only thing that he can do, right? Again, John the baptizer is looking out Jesus out in the, out, coming to him. And he says, behold, the lamb, uh, you know, that's going to take away the sins of the world. But he also says, I'm not able to stra uh, strap his, his sandals. He says, I baptize with water, but he baptized with fire. The Holy Spirit. I, I can clean up the outside. I can give you a bath. But this guy is coming. He's going to clean the inside. He's going to refine you. It's big. And lastly, how much more will the blood of the Messiah, which they all had to come to, to grips with, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleansed our consciences, or you know, our, our, our spirits, from dead works to serve the living God. That's big. That's the whole decision that they're making in verse 14. Right? Number one, they have to they call him Messiah. And some of these guys might have been the ones that were out there saying, crucify, crucify, crucify him. And then years later, now they're looking at uh, teachings of Hebrews and they're saying, yeah, the one that we hung on the cross, this is the one now that I'm calling Savior. That's big. This is the one that, that I am putting not only my faith in, but my whole existence in. He's saying the eternal spirit, right, offered himself without blemish to God. He has to first say and acknowledge that Jesus was perfect. And he's cleansed our consciences. We can stand in the presence of God without blemish, not because of us, but because of him. And now the dead works that we've been doing, we have to put those aside and take up this new life of the living works 
faith without works is dead. Right? And serve a living God. It's pretty big. It's pretty big. That's the message this morning. I'll go ahead and have the worship.